We're live. Good afternoon to our Noya members and audience. I'm glad you all could join us. I'm Noya member, Giovanna D.B. Cuddy. Today we have Denise Salvatore Garofalo, registered dietitian nutritionist, who's going to talk to us about how eating healthy is so important during this quarantine, how to rebalance your diet, and give us some nutritional tips. Hi, Denise. How are you? Great, great. Thank you. Very good. How's the weather where you are? Beautiful today. I think it might actually be spring. <laughs> good enough to go for a walk, huh? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get started. Um, we'll get started. I'll be the first to admit that ever since quarantine, I haven't had my structure of gym time, walking the dog, um, picking up a salad from the local restaurant. Uh, if any of our viewers, you know, are watching and have the same or some sort of unbalanced routine, please share that with us. Um, with that said, Denise, can you give us a short and sweet answer to this? Well, it's very easy to lose a routine. Okay. And what's best is to jot things down, okay. remind yourself that you are going to approach your food life, your exercise life, your work life with some sort of a routine because it, it feels better. Right, that's true. And, and I think, you know, when you lose a routine, um, things occur like you might experience some weight gain and not like it. And that'll be a reminder that you need to make a change. Right. Oh yeah. I feel that pain. <laughs> well, um, what's the first thing you suggest to your clients, Denise, when they say, Denise, I've gained four pounds since quarantine. Where do I start? Well, interestingly, the place to start is not to gain an ounce more. Okay. <laughs> Maintaining your present body weight is enough of a challenge. When you gain weight, it's really hard to lose it. So number one would be to maintain your present weight. That creates a homeostasis, an equilibrium. Okay. And then you can start from there to chip away. The second thing I would say is what I do, but I'm, I'm the quintessential environmentalist. So I'll take the inserts from boxes and I'll remind myself that I want to hydrate with water or I want to hydrate with skim milk because milk is something that everybody needs their entire lifetime. Mm -hmm. So I, I have to remind myself that I can eat three meals a day. This is on a manila folder that I folded in half and that I don't need small frequent feedings. I'm not, it's not necessary to graze. I'm not an insulin dependent diabetic and Disease, disease situations have a completely different um, need. The third thing I do is um, I prepare for my hunger because I know I can run hungry. So if I'm not, if I don't have food in the refrigerator or if I'm not prepared with dinner, even knowing what I'm going to have or have it thawed, there's a very strong possibility I'll pick in between and I don't want to do that. So I um, have food prepared. And the fourth thing is I do three meals a day, mm -hmm. breakfast, lunch, and dinner, timed four to five hours apart. And I can assure you, being an eater, about three hours in, I'm thinking about food. Right. And I have to oh. say, get over it, <laughs> go out, take a walk, go in the garden, mm -hmm. do something. You can wait till noon mm -hmm. and train myself. And you can actually do that. Train yourself back into a routine back into habits. And then last, I'd get outside and I move. If you um, have access to dirt and you can put a few seeds into a flower pot, you can, you can grow some vegetables. I have a daughter that is using scallions every single meal, they're so delicious. She <laughs> cuts off the bottom and there's some roots at the very bottom. She sticks them in the dirt and the next thing you know, three days later, they've grown into tall scallions, which is oh, easy. Yeah, which is easy and it's fun. And it just gets you out of the kitchen and out of the house to 
Yeah, I like that because before you know it, you've wasted some time out there, maybe 20, 30 minutes, forgot about your hunger, you know, and, and then maybe by then it's time for lunch. Yeah. Right, exactly. That's what you want to do. You want to think about all the other great things you could be doing besides eating. Right. <laughs> but I like that manila folder idea. Um, do you have that on the kitchen counter? I put them wherever. Sometimes they're in my bedroom, in my kitchen. I've done this since I'm young. When I was really young, living at home with my mother and father, I used to put pictures of scantily dressed women everywhere, which my father thought was very entertaining as a reminder to control because I've always had a wonderful appetite and I think that's okay, but you just have to learn, learn how to, how to control it. And then this one is, this is the end of a, of a, of a notepad. Okay. And this, this reminds me that right outside my door, I have three hills that I've been avoiding and now I don't avoid them anymore. I want, because, um, I want to get a little bit more of a moderate exercise in my life. I like this. I like all of this and I feel more at ease hearing it. I'll tell you all of this, um, the manila envelopes of putting them out, you know, meal eating and hills, um, all of that. And like you said, when you were younger, you were putting pictures of women. I remember friends doing that growing up. They would put pictures of ideal fit women around their bedroom or, you know, their bathroom, just to remind them to stay fit. do help, they really do. And I have this one also here. This is a 1950s dish. Okay. It's divided into three segments. Yes. And believe it or not, this largest segment is not supposed to be meat, chicken, or fish. This is supposed to be vegetable. Meat, chicken, or fish is supposed to take up a small part and starch another small part. I think and we then, kind of flipped the roles there. <laughs> yep, we, that happened over time. And uh, so that, that I have out as a reminder um, that the portions could be contained and that vegetables need to be the largest part of the meal. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Um, well, it's good to know. I feel like those are um, affirmations. They're nutritional affirmations, putting hills and three meals a day and pictures up. So I like it. Again, any viewers, if you have any questions, comments, or you know, you feel like your routine has been unbalanced, please feel free to make a comment. All right, so uh, let's go to the next question. Denise, um, you know, we are all aware that this quarantine is changing our habits, diets included. What are the absolute do's and don'ts um, to keep in mind, depending on age. For example, what should children, teenagers, adults, women in menopause, the elderly eat or absolutely avoid? So if I break it down into the different stages of life, the different ages, like you just mentioned, we'll start with children. Okay. Children is probably the most important stage because we have about 10 solid years to hardwire children with likes and dislikes. 10 solid years, okay. Ten solid years. It's not to say that if we didn't do it right, it's not possible to change later, you can change later. But it okay. makes it easier on the human being, the individual, if um, the habits they acquire young mm -hmm. are, are embedded and then they just take them through life. So okay. um, the greatest message you can give to children is to like food. To have a good relationship with food and not to be afraid of food. Uh, having been an eating disorder specialist in a major psychiatric hospital, I can tell you that there are a lot of people who are very afraid of food. So that's, that would be a gift you could give your child. So the way you could do that, I have broken it down to five ways to think about. You can present new foods with a positive facial expression. I remember my mom when she didn't want us to have too much sugar because she was very teeth conscious and she didn't want us to have tooth problems. So if we ever had something in our hands that she didn't think we should have been eating it, she'd make a, a really disgusted face. So if you want to make a disgusted face, make it to something that has addictive properties. If you want to be like Popeye, 
Mm-hmm. Not spinach. You can have. You can present it with a favorable twist, and children will take to that. Okay. Reward good behavior with something other than sugar. It could be some money for the piggy bank. And then you could say when you've accumulated certain amount of dollars, we'll go and buy a toy. Or it could be an outing, an adventurous outing for exploring or a special toy, but it should never be sugar. Okay. I like that because it's so hard. It's so easy, I should say, to reward us. Oh, let's go get an ice cream or you deserve an ice cream for finishing a big project. Um, yeah. And it gives, it, well, it gives the meaning to sugar that it's so great. Okay. <laughs> that, that's why, because you did such a great thing where you're going to get a great sugar thing. Mm-hmm. But I think that in a normal life, desserts and ice cream are part of a normal life. They should just be downplayed, not be handed to the child when any great enthusiasm. Oh, like we're, we're going to have ice cream as soon as you finish your dinner, that mm-hmm. sort of thing. Yes. Understand number three would be understand that many children cannot sit still for long. And then as even if you would like them to be part of the family, part of sitting down to a meal, um, they will be able to do it for a brief period of time. And some children will be able to do it for longer than other children, but mostly children get distracted. So I have a two and a half year old granddaughter who's here. Mm-hmm. And I said to my daughter from two and a half to probably about four, you're gonna follow her around with the string bean and put it in her mouth or a piece of chicken and put it in her mouth. She's so distracted that she doesn't even realize she's eating all these things. Now this child eats everything. She likes beans and chickpeas and broccoli rob and fish and requests salmon, and cultural foods, things with turmeric and cumin and, yes. and curry and things that aren't part of the typical Amer- uh, Italian American diet. But sometimes we're following her around. That's okay. Eventually she'll come back to the more civilized approach of sitting down at, at a meal. Um, milk is a very important part of the diet from for every stage of the of the of life from gestational to Mm -hmm. to elderly and yes there are there is a percentage of the population that's lactose intolerant but that's a very small percentage so even if a parent is lactose intolerant Mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily mean their child is it's best not to give children um lactose free or gluten free or Oh, don't Um, give it to them if they don't need it. If they don't need it, it can weaken uh, an immune system. It can weaken weaken a body. You're better off giving the child everything and seeing how they do. And mostly, most children will do fine. Okay. If allergies, food allergies like lactose intolerant or peanuts, they are real, real issues to discuss with your MD and your registered dietitian. Many children do outgrow them, but parents are fearful of allowing, you know, yeah. things that, that they couldn't tolerate as a child. And, mm-hmm. and it pays to read up on that because you can actually take a child out of a weakened um, allergic status into a more mm-hmm. accepting of everything. Okay. And now, I have a friend that just, um, I mean, recently found that her, her daughter is glu- um, gluten intolerant. So I don't know, is that something that you can grow out of? So um, gluten intolerance or gluten enteropathy mm-hmm. is something that, uh, how do I want to word it? Because I know it's real for some people and it manifests in intestinal discomfort and, and diarrhea, but mm-hmm. it's, 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 gained in popularity, we'll say, okay. in the last 20 years. Okay. So people think they can't consume foods with gluten. What it is, is that you need a varied diet. So if you have bread for breakfast, mm-hmm. you really don't need bread at lunch or bread at dinner. As a matter of fact, you want to vary the complex carbohydrates, aka starch, So that if you have bread at breakfast, it might be a potato at lunch and rice at dinner, oatmeal the next day, peas, 
that sort of thing. And then the uh, lack of uh, a buildup will make the body be able to tolerate everything okay. better. Very good. We'll move on to teens. Okay. <laughs> and uh, teens are a completely different entity. Right. <laughs> uh, again, I'll refer to my voracious appetite here and there in life. I, my friends know me as saying, I'm eating like an adolescent male having a pubertal growth spurt today. <laughs> and by five o'clock, I've had my 1500 calories that I have to stop there. I like you though, I like that. <laughs> You're so honest. Well, it's a real issue. But for those people that are raising adolescent males, yeah. know that that group of people, that's the only person ever in the life of humans that can consume 7,000 calories a day. Oh, my God. An adolescent male, particularly a tall one. A tall one can go up to eight, 9,000 calories a day. Sometimes that concerns parents. They feel that this child is going to acquire a weight problem, an obesity problem, and it isn't necessarily the case. They're mm -hmm. going to acquire height and muscle development. And so the best thing that that child could do is what we used to see in the olden days, go to the refrigerator, take that half gallon of milk and pour it in. You can really acquire most of your nutrient needs through okay. milk. But if you have food available before the child comes home from school or mm -hmm. after the child's working, or then um, they'll eat good food for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, plus the milk and make it through that. Young mm -hmm. women at in the teen years, they're often body image conscious. Um, and if they're menstruating by 13, which they should be, the appetite premenstrually is like a bear. And sometimes <laughs> that scares children. The attitude might be like a bear too. Just... Yeah, the attitude might be also. And we have to write that in our appointment books to save ourselves <laughs> because they will get through that week. And then the week after the appetite goes away, the, the sweetness comes back and it all balances out. So okay. teens have to be made to feel that this is all normal, it's all hormonally driven, sure. and we're here to help. And then we move on to um, women in menopause, another very special situation. Um, mm -hmm. Period makes you hungry when sure. you're going through menopause and that hormonal changes is taking you away from having those voracious needs. Yeah. Um, you really don't know what's going to happen. You have to ride it through. On the other side, I can assure you, you feel better, everything stabilizes. Mm -hmm. The two most difficult things a woman in menopause, or three actually, would confront are the effects of wine and alcohol on hot flashes. Okay. The absence of adequate fluid for hydrating. Okay. And the effects of caffeine. Gotcha. Caffeine and alcohol are powerful drugs to monitor during menopause. And then elderly have completely different needs. Um, technically, they've categorized me in that group now. Not too thrilled about that. I love <laughs> your humor, Denise. <laughs> I'm on the young side of elderly but when i think of elderly i think of 80 and above and basically they are people who need help they don't want to shop they're sick of it they don't want to have to wipe everything down during covid and bring it in and worry they don't want to have to store it they don't want to have to cook it and dirty pots they need help they right. need food brought in and put at their door and they often have dental issues or uh, gum issues, the food should be soft, and um, it wouldn't hurt to have some supplemental beverages around for the elderly. So each stage of life could be a presentation in and of itself, but that gives you a smattering of the biggest concerns for each stage. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of information, but I like the way you put it. I mean, you simplified it, added a little humor in there, but um, 
It all makes for good information. I like it. <laughs> Very good. All right. Uh, let's see. Next question, Denise. Um, so uh, this one's a two part question. Part one, what do you typically eat for breakfast, lunch and dinner during this lockdown? So during this lockdown, it's a very unusual circumstance for me. I have my two adult daughters, their husbands, a two and a half year old, an eight week old and a dog living with me when I usually don't. Okay. The good news is that they're all fabulous chefs. So, and they make wonderful food and, and it's in line with my preferences. You're lucky. I like it. Lucky in that regard. Yes. I'm lucky that they even came. So they're New Yorkers and New Yorkers are having a difficult time. So everybody quarantined and now we're together. But prior to the COVID, um, before lockdown, I was more on the run, more meeting my girlfriends at the local cafe mm -hmm. and having coffee, trying not to have caffeine, but I too have an addictive personality and I have to beat myself up to go decaf or half a half, go and have a latte. And sometimes it would be a croissant. So that calorically might've been not excessive, but it isn't necessarily what I want to do regularly. Um, also, prior to lockdown, if I was out and about uh, shopping, I might drive through the local pizzeria that I know is a good one, grab a slice. I think life before was more on the run and grabby. Dinner, well, we like music and we go to listen to live music a lot. So that puts you in restaurants, taverns, some clubs, lounges, mm -hmm. and food is not necessarily made the way I want to. I try to eat half of what's served, but doesn't always work, but right. I try. And so now that is all gone by the wayside for two months, and now it's much more clean. Mm -hmm. Now could be steel cut oats, because there's okay. time to cook it. I might go into the garden and I have kale that was that weathered over the winter. I take that, I chop it up, I saute it in a little tiny bit of olive oil, throw it into the oatmeal, stir that about, grate a little tiny bit of pecora romano or some other kind of cheese, but very little, an ounce for a whole pot serving six adults. And at the end, you put that in the bowl, you can uh, poach an egg and put that right on top. That's a completely different breakfast than a croissant. <laughs> I mean, all of that sounds so fancy, but at the same time, it sounds just simple. Like, it just sounds like something I would go get at a brunch at a nice restaurant, but you've just simplified it. You just told me like four, three or four ingredients and that's it. Yeah. And if you make too much, it's there for tomorrow. So you don't have to cook it tomorrow. I like it. Well, if we have any viewers that you know, um, want to share what places they miss eating or, you know, if you have feeling at fault of the bad stuff you've been eating or, you know, missing any good stuff, viewers, please chime in, you know. Um, but I know you're, I know what you mean, Denise, you go through um, local coffee place, you grab your cappuccino to go. You know, I miss going, getting my salads, which I think are healthy. And some of the places are not exactly healthy. I could have probably had half the calories at home eating a tuna fish sandwich or something. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I find this, this uh, quarantine kind of frustrating at times because, you know, you're just mentioning how you go listen to live music, you're having drinks, you're having food, you're going out. So we're at home, we're not eating as much. Shouldn't we be thinning down? But, you know, for some of us, it's the, uh, I guess, the diet at home and the lack of exercise, I suppose. Yeah, and portions. And portions. And portions. Oh, right. Yeah. So, um, if most women, uh, mm -hmm. really, if you if your exercise level has gone down to sort of a low level as opposed to the moderate before quarantine, most women only need about twelve four, to fourteen hundred calories. Okay. And most men only need about eighteen hundred calories if their activity is low okay. so yeah you do need to 
adjust for your change in activity. But quite honestly, there's no reason why you couldn't put on a mask and go out for a walk. And what we find is that if we drive to a certain preserve or land trust or park, and there's a lot of cars there, well, we leave and go to the next one because we don't wanna be around a lot of people, or we go to a larger one where right. the likelihood of running into somebody is low and still get the exercise in. And one of the things that I learned by working with a personal trainer at one point in my life, right before my daughter got married, mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to walk three miles, five miles, 10 miles. You can walk a couple every day, Okay. one to two. If you don't do anything and you increase it to one, that's seven a week and 28 a month. There you go. So that's a lot. Now, mm -hmm. there are people who have difficulties walking, their hips hurt, or their feet hurt, or they have COPD, and, and they don't want to be out in the allergies. That's a different situation. Then you might put on a YouTube um, presentation and see what you could do at home. There you go. If you sit on your butt, <laughs> and you put your legs straight out and your upper body up, and you just try to balance on that butt, for the count of 20 to 30 to 40, 50, you're going to find that that is going to be an amazing core exercise. Okay. Ooh. Try that, if nothing else, and, and reduce the portions. Okay. I got to remember that part. But I, I like to remember what you also said at the beginning of our discussion about three meals a day, you know, try not to snack in between. So yeah. just to reiterate what you said earlier. Yes. Uh -huh. Very good. Um, so here's another question I have for you. We, um, we hear that a lot of farmers um, have, have had to throw away foods um, that are not being sold enough in the grocery stores. Um, is there something of nutritional value that we, that we could cook with these foods in order to help the farming industry as well as eat healthy for ourselves? Yeah, so... Um... Very interestingly, I think even prior to COVID, mm -hmm. um, people were wanting farm to table foods and farmers were selling bulk to restaurants, schools, institutions. Yeah. And sadly, this whole pandemic is very sad. It's very difficult and it's unprecedented. So we're going day by day to try to figure out how to how to live with this. But sadly, you know, if you have food and it's not being used, it has to be thrown away. It's going to spoil, it's going to rot, it doesn't last. So we can support our local farmers. We, uh, we Googled, um, well, fortunately we have the computer. Yeah. And um, I say that because in my lifetime, the computer didn't exist prior to, well, in the, in the way it does now prior to 25 years old. So mm -hmm. right now we can Google farmers markets, CSA, which are um, community agricultural uh, programs, uh, uh, fishermen, you just Google local fishermen selling their wares uh, mm -hmm. and you'll find that they're available. Okay. So we did that and we ended up going down to a dock uh, just 15 minutes away mm -hmm. and buying scallops from a cooler from the back of the fisherman's truck. That's uh, a great story right there. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and that's, that's something that is regularly occurring right now in every state. I think farmers are uniting also to try to figure out how to let the public know that these foods are available. Okay. And then once you get them, once you bother to go with your mask and your gloves out to a spot that you're not 100% sure of, meeting people that you're not 100% sure of, and it's very frightening, um, you do everything right, you can pay for it mm -hmm. before you even go to pick it up. Oh my now, God. I mean, Venmo and Zoom are two words that came into my vocabulary 
in the last two months. Mm -hmm. and, or, and so that helps you so you don't have to exchange any money or touch anybody. Once you go and do that, you may mm -hmm. want to buy more than you need for one meal. So if you're going to a produce okay. farm and you buy a lot of spinach, like five pounds of spinach, well, you can't mm -hmm. eat five pounds of spinach right away because you would not feel well. And so, but you can blanch, cool and freeze in portion sizes, any vegetable, cauliflower, carrots, you, you know, blanch and I like to blanch in small amounts of water. And then I save the water. I cool it and I put it in a quart container and I put it in the freezer. And now I have an ingredient for my vegetable soup. Oh so, my gosh. So you can do that with any vegetable. I do it with corn, with cauliflower, with spinach, with kale, with any vegetable and I save the water sometimes in little containers in the summertime if I'm baking a lot of corn at once I save the water it always fills up a couple of quarts yeah it goes in the freezer and it becomes part of a, a soup you, you are so resourceful that's so resourceful I like it well I actually find it to be easy and there's so many nutrients in that broth you can call right. it a broth yeah. I have to put it down the drain Mm -hmm. so, anyway, so that's how you can help the farmers and and process it and preserve it for yourself. Okay, I like that. So just to reiterate, just kind of look online, look for your local farmers, find where they are, go ahead and purchase your items, lobster, scallops, vegetables, and, um, and uh, go ahead and purchase it and then go pick it up. I like it. Yeah. And then yeah. bring it home and process it mm -hmm. in a way that is sustainable. Okay, very good. Um, so we have a question uh, from Carmela Schiano. Um, I am told corn is so bad for us. Is it? No, it is not. Okay. Um, corn, each kernel has fiber. Okay. And the inside is nutrient rich. Mm -hmm. When it's converted to a corn syrup it's a different story okay. but when it's in the raw form mm -hmm. it, it's a complex carbohydrate uh it falls under the category of a complex carbohydrate slash starch starch has had a bad rap for the 40 years that i'm a registered dietitian <laughs> the joke has been i I've been a def defending a potato for 40 years. It's the same with corn, okay. potatoes, rice, pasta, corn, peas, beans. They are complex carbohydrates and they have a lot of nutrients. If you Google the nutrient content of corn, you'll see, you'll see that it has nutrition and you'll see it has fiber. And in a varied diet, how frequently are you going to really be eating the corn anyway? I only wait to August when it's really in season. Okay. And, um, but then I do take some in September and I blanch it, mm -hmm. save the water and freeze the corn for the cold months. And I just learned something from this uh, potato advocate that I'm interviewing right now. <laughs> I've always heard potatoes are so bad for you. So I always try to avoid them, but you're the potato advocate. You're saying that's okay to eat potatoes and corn and, and the other starches. Yeah. So, and again, if I, if I refer back to this 1950s plate, which is smaller than the plates we have, I should probably have it one side by side. You know, show. somebody thanked you for showing that plate, by the way, one oh, of the viewers. Very good. Yeah. The potato go. would fit in here. Say that again? The potato would fit in one of the smaller compartments. Okay. And just to reiterate, can you show our viewers again that might have missed the beginning of our discussion? What okay. part is supposed to be the meat side from this 1950s plate? So, you know, in present day thinking, you would think it's this, but it's not that, it's this. These are kind of equal in size. This is the potato, this is the protein. It's about three, four ounces. And this is the vegetable. So if this is a big mound of spinach, 
You also have a little side of salad and you have a cut up apple. So the apple salad and spinach, that fiber helps to fill you. And that is also instrumental in disease prevention and obtaining all the vitamins and minerals that you need. The potato is very high in B vitamins. Mm -hmm. And um, if you look up these food items, you'll see uh, what the value is. You know, you can, you can look at the cup half empty or the cup half full all the time, but you wanna look at what's favorable. But the line that I have used all my life again is sugar gave starch a bad name. Okay. <laughs> Potato, rice, pasta, corn, peas, and beans are broken down more slowly. They provide you with glucose. And that's what scares people because that's a sugar, but they're nutrient rich. And the process of the metabolism of these food items is altogether different than sugar. Okay. So yes, corn is vital in, in a varied diet. I like it. I like it because, you know, like we are saying, we hear so many things of corn being bad, too much potato, has too much sugar, all of these things, pasta. I mean, I can't live without pasta at least once a week, um, but it's good. It's reassuring to hear that from you. So, yeah. And Denise, you know, before I forget, do you have a website or a particular email in case anyone has questions or would like to get in contact with you? Oh uh, yeah, I could give uh, an email address for sure. Sure, sure. If you want, you can say it out loud now, and then we can also share it later. Okay, Salvatore with an E, fifty four, at S B C Global dot net. Perfect. Okay. And I'm happy to receive any questions, and delighted to share whatever I can. Yeah, you never know. Somebody might have a question or need some more clarification and, or, you know, we have a lot of people enjoying this uh, discussion anyway. Um, we have another question from Danielle uh, Chiracella. Do you prefer white rice or brown rice? Well, I use both because I, I like a varied diet. Brown rice has a little bit more fiber, uh, mm -hmm. but I I am not afraid of white rice. <laughs> I do use white rice. I obtain my fiber from uh, a diet rich in vegetables and fruits. So I have adequate fiber in my diet, but yeah. And the same with pasta. Mm. I really only like semolina pasta. And mm. I think that's the Italian in me. Mm. Um, I don't like, um, green or red or fiber or wheat. I like semolina pasta. So I don't count on pasta for my fiber. I count on the vegetable, the steamed broccoli with lemon or, and the salad for my fiber. We have a lot of viewers just love your humor. Uh, viewers out there, if you really like Denise's humor, just give me a thumbs up, give us a heart, give her a heart um lol anything i mean i'm getting a lot of great comments denise the way you put things the way you deliver information um i feel powerful i feel like i'm more at ease and i don't feel um you know uh scolded or afraid right eat right you know so i that's appreciate so that from you so very important and that's the message you want to give to children yes so <laughs> grow older and they become adults. They don't have to feel guilty about everything they do. Oh, you're getting a lot of love right now, Denise. Lots of hearts are bubbling up here. Perfect. I'm so happy to hear it. All those hearts are making you even more heart healthy. <laughs> All right. So I have another one. Um, I have another um, question for you. Um, what, well, what I'm about to say is probably not on everybody's uh, mind when it comes to diet and nutrition. Uh, according to the website fatherly.com, online alcohol sales have gone up a whopping 243% um, since being in quarantine. What is your opinion on alcohol and what drinks do you suggest people um, make for a more nutritional diet, at least during this quarantine time, um, Denise? So, you know, alcohol is a highly complicated, complex subject. Okay. <laughs> we, 
we it's there's no nutrient requirement in alcohol that's essential in our diet it's right. purely recreational it's alcohol can be addicting we all know people who have struggled from it who have survived the struggle alcohol can be dehydrating which is can make somebody faint when they don't even realize what the heck happened to them <laughs> and it, it is a risk factor for many diseases yet it has been determined essential during the pandemic. Nice. How about that for about a conflict that. in um, what to think about alcohol, right? That's really confusing, right? Yeah. So I say, if I want to re recreate with a drink, I like to pick one that's got some kind of value to my body. So. I have two seltzer drinks I go for. One has a shot of Campari, and which is bitter, and a thick wedge of orange, which I squeeze into it, and, and I put it in a nice glass. And so that's one of the skinny drinks I use. Another one is um, seltzer with a shot of coconut rum and a wedge of fresh pineapple. So you see, you get our fresh fruit in there with our alcohol. Another way to do that, get fresh fruit with the alcohol, is to fresh squeeze orange juice or grapefruit okay. and have one shot of vodka. It's like okay. a screwdriver. All right. That would be, and then if you have a fabulous wine, because I don't like to drink anything that's not fabulous, not worth the calories, mm -hmm. four ounces is really only a hundred calories and that's a decent size glass of wine. When you mean wine, are we talking Prosecco? Are we talking red wine? Or does well, it matter? It's the person's preference. Okay. Um, red wine, grapes, and white wine, grapes both have uh, medicinal value. Um, so, and then the, the skins of the grapes are made into grappa. If anybody has the ability to tolerate grappa, <laughs> not me either. But um, there, are, there, there are some medicinal values to wine. But of course, once you exceed the amount you're supposed to have, then it becomes a risk factor and not a medicinal value. Sure. And, but that's basically um, what I call an item in the miscellaneous group, right. alcohol, sweets, caffeine, these are what are called miscellaneous items. They're not essential and they have to be managed. They're not essential, yet you did say it's one of those essential things that need to be open during a pandemic. Yes, how Here. about that? How about that? Yeah. But I like that you mentioned, you know, what drinks. So, I mean, for me, it's a glass of wine, usually a glass of Prosecco. Or last night, um, that was last week. Last night, um, it was a small glass of uh, shot of vodka with um, orange juice, but it was not freshly squeezed. Does that make a difference if I'm getting store-bought orange juice versus freshly squeezed? Well, that's a very good question. So basically when an item like the juice of an orange is, is taken away from the skin that contains it, when it's opened up and bottled, it loses its nutritive value. Okay. Same as walnuts in a shell. When you take them out and put them in bags, they're not as rich in nutrients as if they were in their original shell. So, uh, and some of the juices have a little bit more sugar than you would like in your body, you know? So uh, it's, it's best health-wise if you can have the actual fruit. Okay, very good. Yeah. No, I didn't. I mean, I felt like um, the orange juice was a little sugary, but then, you know, with you bringing that up, it makes for really, I'm, I guess I want to learn a little bit more, like what's the difference here. So thank you for clarifying that. Sure. Appreciate it. Um, if we have any other viewer questions, uh, you know, we'll probably be wrapping this up soon. Denise, what do you have in mind for dinner tonight? You know, I have these fabulous chefs here 
Right. <laughs> I think they're making turkey burgers. I'm being very spoiled. I don't have to cook or clean, and it's really wonderful. And they, turkey is a lean meat. Um, I have uh, kind of decreased my animal fat intake, and um, I'm using more lean meats, uh, at poultry and um, fish and beans as my source of protein. They, turkey is a, 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 a meat that doesn't have, it's not rich in flavor, but they add things, herbs and spices that I'm not accustomed to cooking with, which I say, look on the computer, there's a world of uh, amazing uh, uh, ingredients that you can add to, to turkey meat to make it interesting. So we're having turkey burgers, Probably we picked, um, one of the things I learned uh, this winter from my daughter is that the tendrils, the spikes with the flowers off of the kale plant, okay, uh, yes. that they are something that's gourmet in Italian cooking in certain regions of Italy. Okay. Well, I, I have two kale plants that I mentioned before that weathered the winter because it was a temperate winter. And they're abundant in these tendrils with flowers. So we're going to saute them up. This will be the second time. The first time we had them a couple weeks ago, the two and a half year old grabbed the bowl from the middle of the table, pulled it towards her and went at it. They wow. were so delicious. Who knew? So keep an open mind even about um, new things in the adult diet, things that you think that you hate Right. They really might not hate anymore. It's and they might be like asparagus or bell peppers. <laughs> you might need to prepare them a different way. Bell peppers are wonderful roasted. Okay. Very good. An asparagus oh. uh, with mm -hmm. lemon, a little bit of grated cheese, a little bit of breadcrumbs and baked. Okay. Well, we have some questions and um if you could just answer these super quickly, so we don't run out of time, I'd appreciate it, Denise. Sure. Um, real quick, someone wants to know, uh, should children be taking vitamin D now that we're inside more? Um, what are your thoughts about organ meats? For example, pig's feet, calves liver, and then someone else asked, if they don't enjoy eating meat so much, what do you suggest that they replace? But um, whichever question, Replace meats, vitamin D for children, and uh, your thoughts on organ meats. Okay, so the vitamin D for children, real quickly, that's something you want to work out with your pediatrician. If the child's blood reveals that there's a vitamin D deficiency, then you certainly do need that. Okay. Um, I, I find that people don't drink the kind of milk that they should be, especially adults, but um, children need a lot of milk. And yes, uh, we need some sunshine for vitamin D, sunshine without sunscreen, but that's another thing to discuss with your doc because that's only about 10 minutes in the day. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't want to... Just 10 minutes of the day, that's... Well, that's I think it's a, a discussion to have with the doc. Um, okay. Yeah. And um, meats, if you don't like to eat or you want to try to reduce your meat intake, Mm -hmm. um, certain beans are more compatible with your intestines than other, be other beans. And so if you uh, read the directions on the bag and make the beans soft, you can incorporate beans into your diet in so many delicious ways. One thing we did this week was we pureed white fava bean type bean, we pureed it added really good oil, a little bit of salt and pepper, and had that uh, as the bed of, a, of, a, of a, a vegetable. Another vegetable went on top of that, and then a little piece of fish went on top of that. Um, yeah, so red meat, I'm not going to say it's not valuable, because there are some people whose blood counts just do not show a favorable hemoglobin unless they do have red meat. Once a week, three ounces, which is maybe the size of the meaty part of your thumb. You don't need much, mm. but um, in a varied diet, uh, you, you can have red meat, chicken, pork, uh, fish, seafood, beans, 
eggs, nuts, peanut butter uh, as your protein sources. Keep it varied. Okay, that's a lot. So yeah, it's a lot of variety. A lot of variety, a lot of choice there. I like it. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, any more questions here? We have so many things. Um, Denise, could you go ahead and give us some, um, spit out your email again in case anybody else has any more questions? Okay, it's Salvatore with an E, 54 at sbcglobal.net. Okay. Thank you. Um, Victoria viewers, if you guys enjoyed this, um, please like it, give her some, show her some love, show Denise some love right now as we wrap things up. But Denise is going to be coming back to us in a couple of weeks to share some um, cooking tips, right, Denise? Yep. May 29th, we'll be talking okay. recipes and ingredients. I love and it. I'm going to try to find things with some of the buzzwords of today, turmeric cumin, coriander, um, some of the Indian spices and see if we can't inspire some, uh, some new recipes. Very good. And real quickly, um, Elena wants to know, what foods do you look forward to at this time of year? Can you just name a couple real quick? Uh, so we're in May, we're just coming out of a cold May into a spring. I look forward well, in Connecticut, where I am, the shad fish run up the Connecticut River. This is a special time of the year for Connecticut. Shad and shad row. So that would be the fish and the fish eggs. Okay. And simultaneously here in this area, but only for two weeks, is something called fiddleheads. <laughs> and they actually look like the top of the fiddle. But you have to look at what's in season in your area okay uh, and that that's what will make um may eating special gotcha what's in season very good denise um thank you so much for joining us i want to thank our viewers for all their questions and um she'll be back denise will be back in a couple of weeks same time same place here on Facebook live stream. Uh, Denise, stay safe. Thank you so much. We all appreciate your humor. You put so much humor into answering um, everyone's questions, but in an informative way. And I really appreciate it. My pleasure. And you stay safe as well. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks.